Like I said, it goes against almost everything that culture says is acceptable. So, so if you're here today or if you're listening today and, and you're, you're not a Christian, uh, you might reconsider the fact that you're dating a Christian after you hear this message because I'm going to tell the Christian that you're dating some things they shouldn't be doing. And you might get mad at me. Send the email to Mark Evans at... <laughs> You're welcome. Huh? <laughs> uh, so, but if you're a Christian and you're really, and I really believe this, this is one of the things I've learned on our Tuesday nights. There's a lot of young people in our church, and believe it or not, our average age is about 35 years old, and there's a lot of people in that stage of life that they love God but have no church background and therefore no Bible background, and they want to live for God. But sometimes we haven't told them what the word is saying. And so this is my attempt to do that. And as your pastor, I want you to succeed. Come on. Is there any married folks that wish you would have heard a message like this before you got married? Can you help a brother out, right? And so when it comes to that, I know I'm going to go against a lot of culture right here. But let me remind you as our foundational verse, Romans chapter number 12, verse number 2. Here's what it says. It says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. In other words, we're not necessarily supposed to do it like the world. Okay, a couple amens there. But let God transform you into a new person. Well, how does he do this? By changing the way you think. So you can't change the way you think unless you have some information to process. How many would agree, though, that sometimes the information that you process, when it first lands, it doesn't land pretty? Right? Okay, just want to remind you that. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. Anybody want to know God's will? Okay. Well, if we want to know God's will, we have to start with attempting to do it God's way. Okay? So you will know God's will for you, which is good. His will for your life is good. God's not some killjoy in heaven trying to ruin your life. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundant. He wants you to have abundant life so you can have abundant life if you play the game by these rules. Everybody with me? Okay, you got to help me. I'm scared of you today, all right? So, and it's pleasing and it's perfect. We put, and, and here's the thing. One of the things our society does, and I know this um, just because I've talked to a lot of single people in the church. In fact, I had a long discussion last Sunday in the foyer about it. I think we put undue pressure on people about dating. We put undue pressure on singles in the world. How many singles say, yeah, I know. Like, you're not a whole person if you're not married somewhere. And I want to destroy that myth. That is not true. It seems there is so much pressure, particularly on girls, to be married and to be dating and then to get married. I mean, you go to your cousin's wedding and Aunt B says, well, when are you getting married? Yeah. Like, that's the only conversation you're entitled to have. Single girls, let me give you a little clue. Next time Aunt B says that to you at the wedding, get back at her at the next funeral you go to. <laughs> hey, I'm an equal opportunist here, huh? You say, so when are you going to heaven? I mean, you know, I mean, come on now, right? Let me give you a little background. Patty and I, uh, next Saturday, will have been married 34 years. <laughs> Now, that hand clap is for her, because how many know she's a saint to be married to me for 30? You cannot be weak and be married to me. That's one thing I definitely know. Patty and I have been married for 34 years, but let me let you in on a little secret about our marriage that maybe I haven't shared before. And the secret is, not that kind of secret, shut up, all right? <laughs> when we were engaged, she broke up with me. Can everybody go, wah, wah? She broke up with me, and, and, and really, it, looking back on it now, if I was her dad rather than her boyfriend, I would have said she had good cause to break up with me, because she's seen some things in my family unit and the interaction between some of my family members that was completely opposite and not God-pleasing to the family that she grew up in, and it sent up red flags, and so she broke up with me. So here's what I did. Now, hold on. Let me finish this story before you boo me off the stage. So to get her back, I lied to her. Now, hold on. At the time, 
I didn't know I was lying. But looking back on it, I said some of the craziest stuff because I seen it in a rom-com movie. I heard it in an 80s love song. I heard it in society. So I made some of the dumbest comments. I came to her, and it was a speech. I'm telling you, Hollywood should have picked it up. I said, girl, when we hook up and get together, you know, I talked cool when I was 20, you know. I said, when we get together, it's not about my mom or my lack of parenting. It's not about my family background. It's not about that. When we get married, girl, it's just going to be me and you. Woo! Come on now, that's... But I lied because the truth of the matter is, and I didn't know I was lying, but the truth of the matter is when you get married, it's not just you and her. It's your crazy uncle. It's your whacked out stepdad. It's your alcoholic mother. You come to the marriage with all the baggage that you've ever been through. You drop it at the altar and say, I do. And you run down the aisle carrying all the baggage with you. Any married folks say, you're right, pastor. You're right. See, here's what happened. I made sincere promises that I was not, watch this, prepared to keep. I came to an altar in front of her friends, in front of my friends, in front of our church family, in front of our pastor. We came there. We dressed up for the occasion. We stood there. We promised all of our friends. She promised all of her family. I promised all of her family. We promised God. But I was not prepared to keep the promises that I made on that day. I didn't have the tools to do it. And, and here's what I learned. No one had taught me how to keep those promises. No love song had taught me. If you're trying to get your cues from love songs, oh, Jesus help us today. No romantic movie helped me fulfill my promises. There, there was one simple and powerful principle that I missed, and I want you guys to grab. And here it is. I put it on the screen. Promises are no substitution for preparation. It wasn't my fault, but I had not done the work required to live the life that I wanted. Oh, I hope somebody recorded that. I had not done the work required to keep the promises or the life that I wanted. Yes, I wanted to live happily ever after, but I didn't have the tools in the toolbox. And if I would have listened to some mentors, some coaches, some fathers, come on, everybody, I could have done a little bit better, all right? Just because you say I do doesn't mean, watch this, doesn't mean you're able or capable. So you come to an altar and say, I do. That doesn't mean you have the goods to do it. It means you have a wish. And isn't it funny how we come on that day and we think just by making some promises that magically everything's going to live happily ever after. But just because I made promises didn't mean I was capable. Watch this, though. It just made me accountable. I wasn't capable, but I just made myself accountable to God and to all of our friends and the whole crowd that was there that day. I wasn't capable, but watch this. I was accountable. Now watch the next step. When you are accountable for something that you're not capable to do, it will make you miserable. And you will begin to believe the lie, I married the wrong person. So I better drop this one and go find the right person. Ugh. See, just when we're not capable, it doesn't make us capable it makes us accountable, and when we're accountable to something we're not capable for, then it makes us miserable. Is this making sense? Yeah. All right. So I, as your pastor, we as your church, we want to help you prepare. It's one of the reasons that we're investing in young men on Tuesday nights. We want to help you prepare. Matter of fact, I tested a little bit of this material out on them already, all right? And so, and, 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 it, and if you make... If, we, if you'll let the church come walk beside you, and if you'll make a commitment to prepare, you will unlikely marry someone who hasn't done the same work. When you do the work to prepare yourself, you will, you will unlikely connect with somebody that hasn't done the same level of work. Because one or two things will happen. They'll look at you and not be attracted to your crazy Christian fanatic self. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll move off that. Proverbs 14, 8. I'll just preach wherever I get amens, all right? 
Here's what Proverbs 14, 8 says. You probably never thought this was a dating verse, but watch this. The prudent understand where they are going. Okay? So the prudent, they understand, I'm, I'm, I'm heading somewhere. I have a destination. I want to live happily ever after. I want to have a family. But, but watch this. But fools, they deceive themselves. Now, I'm not going to call anybody a fool, but fools think I can live however I want. I, I can veg on porn before I get married and then say I do and then put all that crazy living behind me and from that day forward, I'm going to be a saint. Ooh, ooh. That's how I interpret. But fools deceive themselves. Somehow, magically, I'm just going to show up and say I do and everything's going to work out great. A little swing on the porch, a little white picket fence. Come on, everybody, right? Okay, um, a prudent person understands that all of life is connected. All of life. What I'm doing today determines who I'll be tomorrow. All of life is connected. Where they are going is determined by what they are doing right now. Watch this. I put this on the screen for you too. The best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. Oh, I'm going to change them. No, you're not. <laughs> Listen to this lady. I don't want to ask you how old you are, but you're older than 19, and she's trying to tell you from experience, uh-uh. Oh, and, and ladies, I hate to beat up on you, but just for a minute, ladies are the worst because they believe the best. They see us all as a project. Ooh, I'll just love them into the man he's supposed to be. No, you're not because we're thick-headed. And all the men better say amen. You know you're right, because all the ladies are going, mm-hmm, I know that's right, okay? Listen, the best, now I know there's an asterisk, there's a caveat to this. I know that when you get redeemed by the blood of Jesus, I know that when you are submitting yourself to discipleship and mentorship, I know that I am no longer what I used to be. But I'm talking about outside of Jesus, and just because somebody says they're saved doesn't mean they're discipled. It means the good news is they're going to heaven. The bad news is they're still a knuckle dragger. How many know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, so the fool says, regardless of how I'm currently behaving, I'll end up in a place that is completely different. No. You don't eat Twinkies every day and end up with a fit body. All right? Okay. <laughs> Have you ever listened to couples that are dating and how they explain away each other's bad behavior? Right? I know he doesn't have a job, but I love him. I know he doesn't have a car, but I love him. I know he's living in mom's basement and he's 40, but I love him. I know he eats Doritos for breakfast, but I just love him. Ooh, the way he looks at me, them eyes. Woo! Come on. And, and, and that's why people freak out over who you're dating. Because love is blind, and the heart above all else is deceitful. Because when you fall in love, you're no longer using logic, you're using emotion. Come on, help me somebody, right? Okay, now let me tell you something. This was the original reason in the Old Testament uh, for uh, uh, bridegrooms and uh, bridesmaids, or groomsmen and bridesmaids. That was the original reason. It wasn't just that those people showed up on the wedding day. It's that those were the friends of the guy and the girl that did life with them, that were able to speak into their life and say things to them. That's what they were for. Girl, you know you shouldn't have been out till 2 in the morning at his apartment all by yourself. You know, right? That's what they were there for. Come on, girl. You can do better than that. You need somebody that's got a life, that has a goal, that has a mission. I know he don't have a job now, but what's his plan? Mm -hmm. Come on, girl. He's pressuring you into things, and he's been with 45 other women. What are you thinking? Come on, everybody. My name's Ken. I'm trying to help you. Okay, everyone? <laughs> The prudent carefully consider their steps. Look at their past, and that is the best indicator of well, where they'll end up. So watch this. The question is not, where are they, and what have they promised? Let me say that again. The question is not, ooh, where are they now, and what have they promised? A better question might be, huh, where have they been, and where are they heading? And I can overcome where they've been. Thank God my wife overlooked and overcame 
the mistakes and where I had come from, my family tree. But she had a strong idea of where I was heading. And she drilled me on every date. Hey, where are we heading? I want to know where we're heading, boy. You know, right? Before I say I do, I need to know. I, I, I understand where you've been. And I'm not going to uh, uh, delete you because of where you've been. Because God's grace is bigger than all that. But I need to know where you're going now. And I need to know how much time has passed since you made the commitment. Ah, come on. Be, be, between where I've been and where I say I'm going, there needs to be a little time because trust is earned, everybody. It shows up every day, not just because I showed up in church today and made some promises that I'm going to be this. Yeah, date long enough that you find out, is he really, is she really telling the truth? Come on, everybody. Is that making sense? Okay, calm down, calm down, calm down. So here's my challenge to you today. Commit now to becoming someone who can keep their commitments later. Commit right now in this message, in this moment. If you do this, when you say, I do, you, you will really be able to say, I do. I do. Those are powerful words. So here's what I want to try to do. We'll see how many we get to. Um, here's what I want to do. I want to give you a before you get married to-do list. All right, everybody? This is, this is before you. <laughs> it's a quiet crowd in here today. <laughs> I'm not sure. You want me to pray right now so with heads bowed and eyes closed, you can sneak out if you need to? <laughs> yeah, I'm sneaking right on out of here. Let me just give you some things. Listen, we've been doing marriage counseling before I was qualified to do marriage counseling. I'm still not really qualified, but I've made enough of my own mistakes that I got a lot of material. <laughs> and so I've talked to a lot of couples. We've talked to a lot of couples, and here's some things that I wish I could tell people before they get married. And so for those of you that are interested, can we just pretend, even though I get loud and bounce around the stage, can we just pretend that it's me and you and your significant other and my wife, and we're just sitting at coffee, and I'm doing my best to be a father to you and help you along. Here's the before you get married to-do list. Number one is address your unresolved childhood issues. <laughs> Mic drop. Bam. Okay, see you next Sunday. <laughs> because 100%, 100% of all our marital problems or because I didn't deal with this. Nobody told me to. I didn't even know I had them. I didn't know what questions to ask. I had a whole bunch. When I told her it's just me and her, I lied. Because I brought, she brought a suitcase, like an overnight kit to the marriage. I bought, I brought like 10 dump trucks and just, <laughs> bam, right on you. And watch this. You know my story. I grew up as a Christian. I loved God. But I still had baggage. Just because they're saved doesn't qualify them. Oh, I got to stay on track. Yeah. <laughs> I like you. I need you to hang out in this church more. All right. <laughs> See, I had some unresolved issues, and I didn't even know I, until I got married, I had anger in me. I, it had never manifested before. But man, when I got married, here's what I learned about marriage. Marriage is only a mirror. It shows who I really am. I didn't spend my first year trying to get to know her. Married spent my first year showing who I really was. Because every time before that, when I got mad or irritated at a buddy or a friend or a date, I could leave. But I just made promises to her dad. I ain't going nowhere. And if I do, he'll hunt me down and kill me. David, in the scripture, was rejected by his father. We know him as a mighty warrior, the guy that killed Goliath. He was a mighty man, but he was rejected by his father. And if you study his life, none of his relationships worked out because he didn't deal with the unresolved childhood issues in his life. And he tried to fulfill the void. Many of us grow up in broken homes or without families or, or, or those things. David was rejected, and so if you study his life, he tried to fulfill the void that was left by an absent father by overachieving and by womanizing. Because when we don't have daddy's voice telling us how great we are, we're supposed to get our identity through our dads. Come on. And our identity is the doorway to our destiny. And minus the void. You, dads, you can physically be there, 
but verbally, emotionally, spiritually be absent. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't do nothing. Why are they mad at me? That's the point. Uh, I'm going to preach this next coming Tuesday, a week from now, to the young men, the difference between being a lion and a lamb. A lion sometimes does something when he shouldn't, and a lamb sometimes doesn't do something when they should. But Jesus was both a lion and a lamb. Mm -hmm. he, he was trying to fulfill voids. If you study the life of David, he was an overachiever. I mean, he tore up everybody. He had anger boiling inside of him. And, and, and he took women from every country that he conquered. Because outside of a father's voice, he was looking for somebody. Listen, when the, when the prophet came to his house and his dad, Jesse, brought in all the brothers, they brought in everybody to be considered if they were going to be the next king. His dad, Jesse, didn't even, bring Jesse or didn't even bring David in from out of the field. So he thought, all my brothers my dad loves, but he doesn't even think enough about me to put me in the lineup. So dad doesn't think I'm great, so I'll go to this girl and she'll tell me I'm great, and I'll go to this girl and she'll tell me I'm great, and I'll go to this man and he'll tell me I'm great, and I'll go to this sex, uh, and, and that'll tell me I'm great, and that'll fill the voids that are missing in my life. Let me just tell you this, no person can do that, uh, and, and no person can fill those voids. No, no, no episode, no one night stand, no 30 night stand can fill those voids that was supposed to come from a father, and if we don't get them through the father, we can get them through the heavenly father. You need to know who you are before you jack up somebody's life. You don't even know who you are, so you can't be one together. Come on, everybody, right? No person, listen to me, no person can be everything you want them to be. I love premarriage counseling, and I'm not making fun of any of you that have come to this church for that. I love it. But most of the time, especially the young people, whoo, I just found Mr. Perfect. And yeah, in about six months, you're going to find out if everything's good. He's not Mr. Perfect. He's Mr. Almost. Because no person can fill every checklist and fill every single void and broken spot in your life. No person can do that. They can help you with that. They can walk with you along those things. Come on. And if you don't believe that, what will happen is you'll think you find Mr. or Mrs. Perfect, and when you realize they can't fulfill every void, you will break it off with them because I haven't found the right person, and you'll go look for the right person. I, I was angry with all my unresolved issues uh, that I had from a, a, a pretty tumultuous childhood. And, but you add those kind of things. You add that to a fatherless generation. You, you add that to girls that are looking for love and guys that are looking for acceptance and approval. Come on. Listen. Let, so let me give you an action step on that. Stop looking for the right person and concentrate on becoming the right person. That's right. Because when you become the person that you're supposed to be, then the right person will be attracted to you. Okay, I got to move. Number two, number two, here's your, everybody all right? All right, don't be mad at me, okay? I, I, I just talk loud all the time. I'm not mad at anybody, all right? Assure your attractions. By the way, depending on where you're at in your spiritual walk, these are either going to get better or worse. Assure your attractions are more than physical. Mm -hmm. It's got to be, I told the guys on Tuesday night, I said, it's got to be more than the curves in the right place. It's got to be more than certain digits at the certain places of the body. And you know what I'm talking about. So now that the ladies are in the room, it's got to be more than biceps and triceps. Or let me talk to everybody. It's got to be more than hips, lips, and fingertips. How many know what I'm talking about, right? Come on. Because here's what happens. You have a few birthdays. It's true. Oh, I want to say so much right there. I really wish we were on a marriage retreat right now. But let me just say, you never look as good as you do on your wedding day. Men, it was impossible for you to look that. You didn't even own anything to look that. You had to go rent something to look that good. 
You had a bunch of guys saying, do this, do that, comb your hair this way, stand here, say I do. And he says, you've never looked that good. And women, I'm not going to let you off the hook either. You had 20 people in your dressing room doing your hair, doing your makeup, zipping your dress, and doing all of those kind of things. And I'm here to tell you, none of us looked as good as we did on that day. Here, I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom, but here's the reality. It's all downhill from there. <laughs> because looks are a moving target. Don't, <laughs> this might not be a place to amen. I'm just saying, all right? <laughs> Unless you're single in the room, and then it's okay, all right? Uh, come on, the grass fades and the flower withers, right? <laughs> and looks fade. Come on, uh, when I met Patty, I was 19, y'all. Come on, how many remember your 19 year old self? 19. You wouldn't even recognize me if I walked past you when I was 19. I'm telling you, I was tan, I was muscular, and I had this long black hair. <laughs> Woo! Man, it was the... I still dream about it. Sometimes I... <laughs> we got married, and my hair started falling out. <laughs> it, it's just a trick God plays on us, Right? I, I got hair now. Somebody asked me the other day, why'd you grow a beard? I grew a beard because I'm trying to camouflage the forest that is growing out of my ears every day. <laughs> and when you're bald, it, hello, this is me. It, it'll grow an inch while I'm here preaching to you. I have to go groom myself for the next service. Come on, everybody. Got eyebrows that are like, I'll attack you. <laughs> now, ladies, you are beautiful. But I want to tell you, some, I, want, I want to challenge you. Refuse to be treated like a commodity. Right. If you don't, he will treat you like a commodity when you're married. And he'll think he owns you and possesses you. Now, I'm not so old-fashioned that I wouldn't say, yes, attraction. Yes, physical attraction. Yes, attraction should be physical. And it might be the first thing you notice about somebody. However, it should also be spiritual, and it should also be emotional. Let me, let me tell you, when I met Patty, she was standing on this side of the stage of our church, playing keyboard, worshiping God. A guy told me, hey, I want to introduce you to this girl named Patty. As soon as I seen her, I was physically, and I can't explain why we get attracted to certain people, but I was physically attracted to her. But watch, did you notice? I was also immediately spiritually attracted to her because she was worshiping God. And so I knew, ooh, this could be the one. Bum, 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 bum. Let me make my move. And then, so... So we went out, we got a milkshake together, and we started a conversation to recognize, hey, is there an emotional connection? You keep making decisions based on body parts, and it will not last. Number three, the to-do list before you get married, number three, is assemble a foundation of friendship first. Assemble a foundation. You ought to marry your best friend. You, you ought to marry your best friend. Let me take you to some scriptures that very few of us ever read because it's kind of, kind of complicated. Song of Solomon, chapter number 1, verse number 9. Here's what it says. It says this. Uh, do I have Song of Solomon? Yeah. Watch these words. Um, I liken you, my darling, to a mare. Now, he's trying to compliment, but guys, this is probably not <laughs> your best play here. All right? I'm just... I know most of you get this, but for some of the guys that say, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be biblical, you look like a... <laughs> Pastor said it. <laughs> and it's funny, we make fun of this language, but we do the same thing. Ooh, he's a thoroughbred. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> I, I, this will give my generation away, but we used to call girls, she's a fox. Come on now, <laughs> right? She's a brick. Uh, oh, never mind. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right? So we, all I'm saying is we, used to use, we use language too. And that's what they're using there. I liken you, my darling, to a mare. I, I, want, I, I highlighted the words my darling because our language doesn't really explain that word good among Pharaoh's chariot horses, all that. Okay, but, but here's what I want you to see. I liken you, my darling. The two words my darling translated in our language He's, what he's really saying is, I liken you, my darling, or my best friend. I liken you, my best friend. 
See, eventually, if you marry your best friend, you could be friends with benefits. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> right? Dating. When you're dating, what do you... Uh, what do they call their parents? How do they talk about their parents? I'd be interested in that. What is he saying about his mom and dad? What is she saying about his, her mom and dad? How do they talk about, yeah, but they grew up in an, I know, I know, but we can still honor them even though we don't have good ones. Mm-hmm. What, what names do his or her mom and dad call each other? Because that might be what he calls you. Could be. I'm not saying it's a make or break, but I would watch those kind of things. Is he talking about my old lady and, and my ball and chain? Right? Come on now. I, I, we, were, we had a, a couple that helped us when we first started dating named Jack and Zelma. Remember Jack and Zelma? And they'd bring us over to their house after church on Sunday. And they'd been married for like 800 years or something like that. <laughs> and we'd go over to their house. And they were this. I look back on it now, and they were so cute. They were so, they were so involved in wanting us to succeed. It was great. They probably recognized that I was a knucklehead and needed help. But they had invited us over a Sunday night after church. They had make dinner. They had pour into us. They'd tell us marriage stories. And I noticed one night when we were there, Jack, every time he would call Zelma, he, he, he would call her like a sweet name. He would say stuff like, hey, babe. And he would, hey, hey, sugar plum, could I get another warm up on the coffee and, and, and hey, sugar booger or whatever the names were, all right? <laughs> You know, and, uh, and they, he kept calling every time she did something. Oh, thanks, babe. Hey, thanks, honey. Oh, oh, thanks, sugar plum, all of that. And I pulled him aside and said, man, how do you come up with all these names? And why do you do that? He said, confidentially, I forgot her real name. So that's why I call her all. <laughs> I wanted to get your attention because I want to say the words you use in your home are important. Let me talk to the married folks for a minute. Set an atmosphere of praise in your home. Listen to me. Please hear this. You get what you praise in life. I'm standing here before you, and some of you will shake my hand and say, hey, thanks for the message. But I'm standing here before you because for 34 years, I've been married to a woman who has not nagged me, but she has praised me into the person I am today. She never leveraged my past against me. She always helped me remember where I said we were going together. You can praise. Ladies, let me talk to you for just a minute. God inhabits the praises of his people. Men inhabit praises too. You text me, hey, babe, how you doing? I'll run every red light in town. I will cancel every uh, meeting I have to come home to the woman who can't wait until I get home. Yes. Set an atmosphere of praise in your home. You get what you pray. Let me say it another way. You do not get what you complain about. You do not get what you nag about. You, listen, listen. Every, this woman has had to hear me preach for 34 years. I'm her only pastor for 34 years. And I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen the minute we get in that big red truck out there. We're going to hop in there, and I'm going to put it in drive. We're going to head toward home. She's going to reach over and touch my leg and say, Baby, I don't know how you do it. Today was the best message I've ever heard. And something rises up inside of me and says, wait till you hear next week's girl. Come on now. Rawr! Right? Uh, you get what you praise. Uh, and friendship, by the way, let me throw this in there. Friendship is, is real intimacy. Sex is not intimacy. Friendship is intimacy because friendship is real intimacy. My definition is into me see. It's your real friends that you let see at your... See, I finally had to come to a place in our marriage when I had to take off the cape, step into the phone booth, and say, I'm really not Superman. I got a whole lot of kryptonite, and I want you to see who I really am. And she loved me for who I really am. And don't ever leverage each other's weaknesses in the argument. Come on, how many know I'm helping more than just married folks here today, right? Ah, she's seen me at my worst, and yet she believes the best in me. Uh, So if you're not emotionally attached, that won't happen. That won't happen if you're not emotionally attached. Because let me ask you something. What will hold you together after the kids are grown? We had a dear friend of ours. After 26 years of marriage, kids moved out, they divorced. Because there was no emotional connection. 
None at all. And this is a pastor. Okay? The kids are going, what will hold you together after the bills are paid? What will hold you together? Let me just be real. What will hold you together after your bodies won't do what they used to do? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me get back to dating. Guys, watch how she treats her dad. How does she treat her dad? Okay, girls, watch how he treats his mom. Those are good indicators. Date them long enough to see how they talk to you after the newness wears off. Mm -hmm. Let me give real quick, and then I'll do the last one. You guys still with me? Yeah. All right. Yep. Use affirming words that bond you together. Right. I'm talking to married folks, too. Yeah. And, and let, me, let me help you a little bit with this. And I learned this, and some of you already know this, but to her, guys, when you're complimenting her, don't, Listen, you can compliment the job she does, but that doesn't give her butterflies in her stomach. Girl, the way you vacuum that floor, woo! No. <laughs> not so much. See, so you're using your language. To her, not, uh, not what she's done, but the quality she has. Right. Instead of, woo, that was a good dinner, how about, man, thank you that every night, as busy as your schedule is, you put the time and the love. I don't know how you do it, and you prepare me a meal all the time. Now, that's just, you got to tailor make that to you. It's not what she did. It's her qualities of who she is because that's how God made her, and that's the role he gave her. That's where she gets her fulfillment. Let's turn that corner a little bit. To him, ladies, compliment his abilities. He's saying, "Woo! look at the way you vacuumed that floor, but that's what he wants. He, he wants to go out in the yard and build something and go, look at this. Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. <laughs> huh? Here's the best thing you can do for a guy. Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> All right? Come on now. Like, <laughs> you know it, babe. Things broke down, nasty. I mean, you know, it, you work on the car, oil's leaking. It's a piece of junk, and it's like, Man, that's awesome, dude, because you get what you praise. All right, everyone? Yeah, you can get what you praise. Let me do number four, and this is the hardest one to preach, but I'm going to preach it despite our society. Avoid sex and living together before marriage. Now, I have no joy in just trying to say this for the sake of saying it. I say this because all of us want God's blessings, but we don't always get God's blessings when we don't do it God's way. Come on. Is there any parents in the house? Yes. Junior, don't do this. Junior does it. There's not a parent in this room in the right mind that as soon as Junior does something that Dad said not to, he goes, wow, let me reward you for that. Let's go get an ice cream cone. Yet somehow we think, that grace means we can live however we want without consequences and ask God to bless what he's already said. Listen, God doesn't bless our plan. He blesses his plan. Amen. And so our job is to discover his plan for our lives because it's already blessed. Come on, everybody sends this out every June for graduation. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you. It's not just for graduates. It's for dating couples also. I know the plans I have. You get in my plan and it'll be blessed. All right? Or you can believe the lie and say, well, everything's going pretty good now. You can believe that lie if you want to. But we're not building with the future in mind. If you build only on physical, it'll... Here's statistics. Um... Let me just say this. Let me slow down long enough to say this. I'm not throwing stones at anybody. I love you. And, and there might be somebody that's in the ditch right now relationally, and we care about you. We love you. We'll do everything we can to help you. But while I'm preaching this message, I'm trying to keep some people from going in the same ditch. Is that fair enough? It's hard to preach to a diverse crowd because there's some that are heading toward the ditch. You want to say, hey, hold on. All the while, the people that are trying to get out of the ditch are offended because you're trying to help those that haven't gone in the ditch yet. 
Does that make sense to everybody? I'm trying to help someone that might be going the wrong way. If I had some boxes up here, if I had four boxes, I, I, would, I would build them like this. I, I would put the biggest box on the bottom, and I'd call that the box of relationship with God. I'd put the next biggest box next, and I'd call that friendship. And I'd put the, the, the third largest box, I'd call that, let's just say... Um, communication. And then I'd take a small box and I'd put it on the top and I'd label it sex. And I'd say, this is how God wants you to build your relationship. Unfortunately, now imagine it. Let's just imagine that the box labeled sex is like a, 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 an engagement ring box, all right? Just for the sake of my illustration. I know some of you are going, not me. It's bigger than that. Okay, anyway, all right. <laughs> but just go with the illustration. What happens in the world's way of doing things is we take that stack and we turn it upside down and we try to make the foundation the engagement ring box and we wonder why everything is so hard to keep together and we're so stressed doing marriage and it's so hard and it's so whew, and it's just one thing causes it to topple cuz you did it your way and not God's way let me say another thing that's hard to say, but just according to statistics, those who are promiscuous and are living together and having sex before marriage are far more likely to have an affair after marriage. Now, wait a minute. Before you get mad, everybody was clapping back there when I said the prudent, <laughs> the best indicator of future is past. Well, here's where it hits the road. The past sometimes will indicate the future better than a promise. To have and to hold, to love only you. Yeah, but my past says everything except that. And there's been no time between the time I stopped doing that to the time we got to the altar to prove or to earn trust. Hold on. Let me say something right here. Forgiveness is given. Trust is earned. And there has to be some time between the last, I'm not doing that anymore, and I do forever. There has to be some time that I look and see, can I trust the person I'm going to hitch my wagon to? Thank you, babe. <laughs> Song of Solomon, I'll end with this. Song of Solomon, chapter number two. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you. She's talking now. By the gazelles and by the does of the field. Watch what she says. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. <laughs> How many of you were born at night, but it wasn't last night, you know? And you can read between the lines what this is talking about. What, what she's saying here is wait until the right time to have sex. Listen, just because we have the desire for something, where is self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit, by the way? Uh, right? I mean, yeah, you got mad on Highway 5. That doesn't give you a right to run them off the road. And just because certain desires have been aroused does not say, let's just go for it. Because we're not animals. We're men and women created in His image. You ought to see your body postures today. Everybody's like this. <laughs> I was going to close right there, but I decided not to. This was a, oh, by the way. I'm going to give you this, oh, by the way, really quick. In case I haven't offended you yet, let me try a little bit harder. <laughs> if I was sitting with you, me and my wife, my wife talking to the women, me talking to the men, and you were my son or daughter, here's what I'd say to you if you were dating. I'd say, number one, limit your alone time. Limit your alone time. Now, some of us are in the room, and we're 40, and we're dating. This isn't just for the 20-year-old that's dating. Limit your, al limit your alone time. Because alone time stirs up passions. And it should stir up passions. But maybe, at least in the beginning of the relationship, a little friend community, everybody going out. Okay, I won't preach you. I'm just going to give them to you. Number two is limit your talk. Remember when I said trust is earned? Yeah, forgiveness is given. Trust is earned. Come on, how many know? Some people just tell too much of their story too fast. It's the first date. Well, what happened with me with Charlie was, no, no. And you start giving your whole history. 
You don't know if you can trust that person yet with the information you're giving. So limit. Th this is why we always get this. Somebody will come to our office and cry. Oh, she broke my heart. He broke my heart. And their heart is broken. And I always want to tell. So let me do some preventative work. Quit giving all your heart away on the first date. You, you give a little bit of your heart away, a little bit of your secret away, and see how they respond. Do they leverage that against you in the next argument? <sighs> when you break up, is it posted on Facebook? See, you got to limit your talk. Um, th there shouldn't be I love you's on the second date. You, you don't even know yourself well enough, and you think you've made a decision about them? Mm, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Anyway, don't give your heart away to... Okay, last one. I, I, I'm way over time. Number three is <laughs> limit your touch. Mm -hmm. Just limit your touch. I, I'll just give one illustration on this. A five-minute kiss doesn't say, I like you. <laughs> A five-minute kiss says, I want you. <laughs> so keep those first date kisses to like 30 seconds. How many know what I'm talking about, right? Ecclesiastes 3, 1 says, There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. And if we'll do things in God's right category, God's not against sex. He's not against dating. He wants you to do it His way because He has abundant life waiting for you. If I was Dr. Phil, I would say to somebody that's dating right now, that's already broken up and already had some crashes, I would say, well, how's that working for you? Just a thought. Would you stand with me all over this place today? Come on, how many will receive that in the heart that it was meant? Would you receive that today? All right.